Hello, everybody, uh, and welcome to the next in our series of COVID-19 webinars from the Royal Society of Medicine. And today we're very lucky to have a true world expert uh, on testing and tracing for COVID-19. Professor Sir John Bell is the Regis Professor of Medicine from Oxford University. He's a government advisor, not only on COVID, but on other uh, biological uh, issues and also a world expert on immunology. So, um, John, let's start off by talking a little bit about what's really in the news at the moment, which is the abolition of Public Health England. Uh, now, is this a, a wise move by Matt Hancock, or there has been some criticism I noticed uh, in the media? So, uh, yeah, obviously pretty controversial move. Uh, I, I, can, I think I can understand why he's done it. He's got a whole set of pretty acute issues relating to the pandemic that he wants to consolidate under uh, single leadership. And that's almost certainly what his main focus has been. Uh, but, I, I, but I also think it highlights a broader issue, and that is that although we always talk about public health, the truth is there hasn't been actually for a generation a major political commitment or indeed professional commitment to public health as an entity. And that might be the start of an opportunity to reinvigorate the whole field. Because it is, I mean, if you just take the pandemic aside, most of our major issues in the healthcare system are all ones where a, a prevention focus and a wellness focus is likely to have a pretty big impact. But because Public Health England hasn't really had the resources to do that very well, uh, and NHS England has sort of let PHE get on, uh, it hasn't really happened. So I think there are opportunities from the changes, which I think could be very good. So perhaps we could use this opportunity to energize the uh, effort to the anti obesity effort, anti smoking effort, uh, fitness agenda, and so on, because all of these are factors in COVID uh, uh, 19 as well. So, yeah, maybe that's something that the RSM could do. Well, we'll start off with it. We've had, I think, nearly 50 questions and more are pouring in. I see that we've uh, almost got a thousand people uh, tuning in for this, John. But um, just explain a little bit to us uh, uh, clinicians, uh, mainly clinicians, but also other healthcare professionals tuning in to this. Um, the, the, the issue of testing, both uh, antibody testing and antigen testing, just explain to us uh, some of the issues surrounding it, could you? Yeah, so there are really two big strands of testing, which I suspect most of the audience will already understand. And one is the detection of the virus, either the viral antigens, the structural proteins, or viral RNA, which is detected by PCR reactions. And that's really the, that, that's how you define whether someone is actively infected. And then to detect whether people have been infected, of course, people mount an antibody response, first of all, an IgM response, not very consistently, I have to say, but an IgG response, which is present in almost all, but not all people, but most of the people have been infected at day 14 and then grows to day 28. And then declines, interestingly, the serological the durability is not great in this disease. So uh, it fades away pretty quickly. Some people have said at a rate of 20 to 30 percent a month. So six months on, a lot of people who might have been seropositive during the course of the epidemic will have started to lose their antibodies. So those are the two big approaches to testing. Um, but then there's a whole set of different um, um, platforms that you can use either to test antigen or RNA or to test um, antibodies. And that's been what all the focus has been on. And I heard you on the Today program um, discussing the issue of sensitivity and specificity of these tests. Uh, so just summarize the issues with that, because, you know, if the test isn't accurate, it's not going to be that helpful, is it? Yeah. So that's been the struggle since the very beginning when I started to help the government think about this. The initial antibody tests, um, both the lab-based antibody tests and the ones that you would use at home, uh, are both... Uh, both of those antibody tests lacked both specificity and sensitivity. And, and as a result, they really weren't much good for anything. And, and our evaluation said, look, we better pause 
before you roll those out because in, in the presence of a relatively low disease prevalence, if you even have a specificity that's 95%, the vast majority of people you'll, who will test positive will be false positives. So that positive predictive value, as it were, is a real limitation to tests in that environment. So the, the whole game in this testing business has been to balance off specificity with sensitivity. As you push for more sensitivity, you get less specificity. And as you push for more specificity, your sensitivity falls away. So you've got to find the sweet spot. The and, and I think a really good example of, uh, and I cited it this morning, of, of a test which is really good are the, are the PCR tests commercially produced available in the Lighthouse Labs. Mm -hmm. And there the sensitivity is very high. Now that doesn't account for the fact that tubes get mislabeled and not everybody has virus in their throat when they get swabbed. But if you do have virus in the throat, it almost invariably 99% picks up the virus until the virus numbers start to wane at the end of the disease. Uh, and in terms of specificity, uh, you know, in the ONS study, we've done 122,000 tests in the last six weeks, and we've only had 58 positives, some of which will be real positives. So if the rest are false positives, it's much less than 0.1% of the um, of the positives or false positives. So, you, you know, that I, I just show, it just goes to show you that these tests are highly, highly specific and also pretty sensitive. So that's what good looks like. They're not all that good, I promise you, but that's a really good one. Mm -hmm. And in terms of picking up the virus, you know, the timing uh, of uh, the, the time taken to get the result back is obviously pretty critical. The, style, the, the shorter the better. So I, th I think, uh, again, you were saying this this morning, and Matt Hancock was talking the day before yesterday too, about the idea that a, a very rapid test, a home-based test might be available for, for the virus. Is yeah, right? so this is, this is a really important bit of the current strategy. So first of all, the, the Lighthouse Labs, which started very slow because they're big centralized labs, and the logistics of getting people to the sampling sites getting the swabs to the center, getting them um, tested, and then getting data back would often take a couple of days, which is way too long. They, they now manage, I think, close to 95% get back in a day. And many of them, and that's from the time you type in the request in the computer, not from the time you get the test. So, so they're doing a lot better, but there are limits to those big central facilities because some people live a long way from the testing centers. You can't get to everybody. It's quite hard, and although there'll be an important pillar going forward, having home testing, it seems to me, is one of the real uh, uh, differentiators that we could move to in the next few months. Because if you have tests at home that cost five or 10 pounds, you use saliva, they give you a pretty reliable result, you won't mind testing yourself a couple of times a week. And that, provided the data gets back in the system quickly, I think all the modelers feel that that fast return of data from home-based tests will be a major factor in reducing the spread of the disease. And I suppose that that might also enable schools to uh, take kids back safely because, you know, that's going to be a big issue in the next couple of weeks, isn't it? We yeah. really get children back. But if, if they could be, if, if you could have a COVID-free school because everybody had been tested, uh, and they're all negative, including the teachers. I, that would make a huge difference, right? No, it will. It will. And, 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 you know, there's a bit of data. I haven't actually read the papers, but there is a bit of data that suggests that kids are pretty infectious when they've got the virus. They're usually asymptomatic and they're quite infectious. So managing the disease in a school environment is going to be really important for the overall track, trace, and isolate program. And, and, and easy to access tests that are non-invasive and which give you a pretty good answer i think are going to be they'll be a they'll be a real differentiator in our ability to manage the disease and i i you know it's it's i think every school is going to want some capacity to do that as will universities as will um as will boarding schools and independent schools so you know everybody will be in it i was talking to somebody from georgia yesterday georgia of course, has had one of the worst outbreaks in the U.S. It, um, it suffers from a variety of political challenges in Georgia. But mm -hmm. the, the government has insisted that 
all 30,000 students have now returned to the university and are now living in dorms with each other in the presence of a major epidemic in the population. And the person I spoke to said it's like a 30,000 uh, passenger cruise ship um, sailing around uh, because that's what's going to happen. They're all going to get infected. Uh -huh. They've got a question in from our uh, past president, Simon Wesley. Was it a mistake to centralize our testing, unlike Germany, or did that in fact mean we didn't waste even more money on unvalidated tests for both antigen and antibody? That's a pretty good question. Yeah, so I mean, it, it's, the, it's at the heart of everything that happened early in the epidemic, and that is that it was very clear that the testing capacity in NHS institutions and PHE couldn't really get itself up to a significant number, largely because the labs were small. All the tests they were doing, PCR tests, were largely home brew tests that had their own issues associated with them. So the decision to centralize was really based around the idea that it was really the only way to manage a high throughput facility that was driven by robotics and automation that allowed you to do a lot of tests, but also to maintain quality control. So the old Dunkirk example of all these little ships. The problem with that is you don't know which ships have got holes in them and which ones don't. And they, it's a real problem about maintaining quality of testing. And in fact, to this day, to their shame, the NHS do not have proficiency testing of COVID testing in their labs. And that ain't good because mm. you should be regularly testing whether the labs are getting the right result or not. So I, the big centralized labs obviously do that routinely. They, spent a lot of time doing it. And so I, I, I don't have any doubt it was the right decision in the first instance to get our testing up to a level. Mm -hmm. Can I just also just add a bit of a sting in the tail on the German thing. The Germans did well, but the, one of the problems with their distributed system in Germany is they did a lot of tests, but because the Germans have a particular aversion to sharing data, no one knows what the results of all those tests were. So it doesn't really help you if you're trying to control the epidemic. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's interesting. Let's switch to antibody testing because, you know, and uh, we, can, we can test for antibodies, but we can't, I suppose, test for T-cell immunity uh, just yet. And we'll come on to that. But uh, I suppose that we're going to need to know who has, in fact, had COVID-19 and who hasn't. I mean, we, particularly Simon is interested in long COVID or uh, uh, the, the prolonged symptoms that could be related to COVID. So any, any thoughts about that, about uh, how, long, how long does do these antibody tests stay positive and, and can they be used to reliably tell who's had it and who hasn't? Yeah, so, so the, the debate about this really revolved around the idea that ministers in March and April decided that it would be a good idea to give people an immunity passport based on their antibodies to the virus. And that if you could test people and they were antibody positive, you could say to them, off you go, you're fine. You can do what you like because you're protected against subsequent infection. Um, that fell over for two reasons. One is we didn't have antibody tests of accuracy that you could use in the first instance. But it also fell over because we don't really know that people with antibodies are protected and for how long. And I think it's the second bit which is the most important. I suspect most people who just had the infection are probably protected. But if the, if the antibody durability is poor, as it is in this disease, then the real question is when do you become susceptible again to the disease? And it may be a few months later. We don't, obviously we don't know about memory B cell populations, but we do know that the, the decline in antibody titers is anything from between 10 and 30% a month. So you can see how with that deteriorating quickly, there are a lot of people now who were infected in March and April who now may have no antibody titers, even though they were infected. Mm -hmm. So the, the challenge comes if you're trying to monitor the long-term effects of this disease and treat people when they rock up a year later with neurological symptoms or cardiac problems, and you don't have a record about whether they had the infection, then you've got a massive problem. And the, the best way to, to know whether they had the infection is to do an antibody test, re record that in the, in the notes. And then you know that when somebody comes in with some weird symptoms, it might be COVID related. You don't know for sure it's COVID related, but at least it's on your list 
where if they have never been antibody positive, then you're pretty sure it's not. So, so I, I think we're moving back again to the idea that we might do some systematic testing of antibody levels just to record whether people have had the disease or not, because the long-term consequences are at the moment a black box. It could be very bad or it could be not so bad. So mm -hmm. that's a crucial so, so I guess when, when they talk about mass testing, you're talking not only about mass testing for the, for the virus uh, in, in the throat uh, and mouth, but, but mass testing for antibodies to see who has had it uh, uh, in view of the fact they may develop uh, post-viral syndromes later. Is, is that what you're really saying? Yeah, yeah. Now, just to be clear, the latter is not government policy at the moment, but mm -hmm. I, there are active discussions going on about whether that might not be a wise thing to do mm -hmm. unresolved. I think where we are committed is moving quickly to mass testing that gets much more rapid turnaround of test times so that we actually have more frequent testing in everybody and the, the, and the turnaround times are much faster so that we can manage the ongoing epidemic in a more sensible way, as we discussed. What about the issue of airports and quarantine, John? Because I, I've got quite a few friends of mine who are stuck in France and uh, are wondering what to do. But uh, again, rapid testing for the virus and maybe also for antibodies of, of everybody coming in, into the airport. What, do you think, do you see that's a way forward as well? Well, I, these tests are pretty cheap and they, you could roll them out at pretty big scale. And now a single test won't, prove that you're negative because obviously you might have early stage infection and it might take four or five days for it to come back. But I think several tests in relatively quick succession, a few days apart, would actually assure people that they didn't have a significant infection in their nose and throat. And, and that would, if nothing else, would greatly abbreviate the quarantine. I, I, I don't think it'll completely eliminate it, but you can't imagine a scenario while you're waiting in the lounge to get on the plane. You might also test yourself before you get on the plane so you know where you are uh, and then test when you get in and then wait four days and test again. So you can imagine if, I mean, this is a world in which testing is home-based. It's easy to do. It's cheap. Why would you not use testing as a way of making a decision whether you can go back in public? And uh, you, you mentioned a little bit earlier that you're, you're actually looking at two testing kits at the moment, which are a rapid, uh, both from South Korea, did I hear you say? Just tell us a little bit about those. Yeah, so, so there, there's a whole cascade of, of tests. They start with a qPCR tests, and the, the Lighthouse Labs are the gold standard there without a shadow of a doubt. Highly sensitive and very, very specific, great tests. But they're centralized, logistically hard. You're never going to get to multiple tests a week in everybody in the country with that. Then there's the lamp tests, which are another form of isothermal amplification and, and, and tests like the Oxford nanopore test, which was announced two weeks ago. They're much more distributable, but they're not home-based tests. So you'd have to, you know, you might have one in your office block, or you might have one down on the corner of the street, or you, and you might be able to get more stuff down there. You might have one in a care home. They, they're gonna be an important part of the story because you can get your numbers up with that. But the, I think the real step forward will be is if you get pregnancy style lateral flow tests for antigen that work at a reasonable sensitivity and a reasonable specificity. And we've just started this week, starting to validate those with our friends at Port and Down. And um, we've looked at a couple already, there's a couple more going through today. And the result, I can't really give you the results because we haven't got a definitive result, but I, I just to say that, um, as you won't be surprised, some of these are terrible tests, so you would never use them. But some of them look pretty interesting. And, you know, at five pounds a pop, um, with high sensitivity, say 90% sensitivity, and high specificity, which may be in the high 90s, they, they could really work. And uh, w that's basically what we're thinking about at the moment. But the validation is still ongoing, so I don't want to preempt a decision. But I think we've seen enough now to believe that this may well be possible as a, as a routine form of regular testing and will allow us to saturation test in the way that, well, originally Julian Pito argued very strongly for, and, and I think there's now a, quite a strong bit of modeling data that suggests this is quite a good way to manage the disease. So say these tests are 90% accurate and cheap, say five pounds or so. I mean, can you see a day where you could like order them on Amazon and they arrive same day or the following day and you get the result back? 
Um, yeah, yeah, uh, for sure. At home. So I think the idea would be to have a have, have a crate of them in your bathroom and just use one whenever you needed it and order it on Amazon buy them in boots. Yeah. I mean, there's a lovely little test from a company called Homodeus in the US, which we're just bringing in to have a look at at the moment. And they make a, it's run by a guy who used to do consumer electronics and he's made a little plastic isothermal amplification device, which is about as big as a teacup, a little bit bigger. You plug it into the wall, it'll do the amplification. You buy the tubes that have got all the solutions in them. You swab your mouth or your nose, you break the swab off in the tube, you put it in the middle of the teacup, you go and have a shower, you bring it up and you poke it in a lateral flow test. And 35 minutes later, you know the answer. And you could do it every morning while you had your cornflakes. So the idea, and they, you know, the tests, they, the machines cost 25 bucks. They don't cost anything. Mm -hmm. and, the, and the tests should be well below $10 a test when we get them down. So you can see a world in which we're just, we're just, to manage the disease, we're all just testing all the time and dropping the data back up into the cloud where yeah. there will be a single database that holds all the data. And it will also help with the managing of local outbreaks. We had a, we had a, last week, we we're talking about local outbreaks and you know, obviously the testing issue came up there. Let, let's um, talk a little bit about, about the future, John, because I, you know, I, I can see the brave new world where your fantastic tests are. I've got them in my bathroom. I'm, it's a bit like a pregnancy test. I'm either, either pregnant or I'm not. I either got the virus or I, or I haven't. But um, you know, there still are going to be some people who are getting ill. And uh, the, the, well, let's talk a little bit about treatment options, um, including you know, immuno immunological treatment options, because you are a, a yeah. an immunologist. Yeah. Yeah. You know, we had an international uh, meeting, COVID meeting, uh, hosted by the RSM. We were pleased to have nearly 10,000 people from more than 100 countries uh, logged on to that. And we were talking there about remdesivir and, and other new treatment options and saying the mortality in hospital is dropping by about 30%. But there's, there's a whole lot more in the pipeline, isn't there, that, uh, uh, that may be able to modify the immunological response to this yeah. disease? Yeah, so they, they really fall into three big camps. There are antivirals, of which we've got one at the moment, which is remdesivir. Um, it, the, the trials of remdesivir started a bit late and, and really couldn't demonstrate a mortality benefit, but it probably works okay. I wouldn't say it's a wonder drug, but it probably works okay. Uh, and it would be better used, in my view, very early on in the disease. And so this is where, because up to now, we haven't been diagnosing people really early in the disease. And if we've been diagnosing them, they go home and nobody sees them. So I think finding a mechanism to capture people who are swab positive early and put them on antivirals will be good. There are a couple of other good antivirals. Merck have got another RNA-dependent RNA, RNA -dependent RNAs polymerase inhibitor, which they are racing through development that uh, I, I suspect will be a really good antiviral. And Pfizer have got an, a protease inhibitor, which the proteases are quite good. So that, there's that bundle of things that I don't be surprised if we see some examples of those in the near future. Uh, and then there's dexamethasone, which I think is an interesting intervention. I, I, my belief is dexamethasone is not acting as a steroid because prednisolone doesn't really work in this disease. Dexa works amazingly well, reduces mortality, and it reduces, it reduces mortality really quickly. So it doesn't have the usual, well, anti-inflammatory effect of steroids where it takes a few days to see an impact it starts almost as soon as you use it. And one of the things that Chris Edwards pointed out to me, Chris, of course, is a great endocrinologist, almost certainly a fellow of the RSM, but the, he rang me in March to say, uh, you know, these folks have really abnormal aldosterone levels. They have very, very low potassium levels and they've got abnormal aldosterone levels. And it's likely that through the ACE2 receptor, the whole renin-angiotensin cascade is up the spout, along with those effects that you get when you do that on the inflammatory cascade. So this could all be explained by disorders in renin-angiotensin, and it, dexamethasone is probably working by blocking cortisol expression and stopping the drive on the mineralocorticoid receptor. And, and that may be how dexamethasone is having its action. You can get this disease, interestingly, without um, the virus. So there's a rheumatologist called Anthony Rosen in Hopkins 
who's been following a set of patients with dermatomyositis for a long time. And it's not classical dermatomyositis. It's an autoimmune disease with a lot of autoantibodies. And occasionally he gets a patient who gets a disease, a pulmonary disease that looks exactly like this. Normally the skin disease is relatively benign, but sometimes they get this and then they almost always die. And he's never been able to find a way to treat them. And when he went back to look at those after he saw that COVID looked exactly the same, all those patients who get lung disease have got autoantibodies to the ACE2 receptor, which is exactly where the virus binds. So you can actually produce a, a phenocopy of this disease without the virus, which I think is pretty interesting because it does, I think, illustrate that this is a renin-angiotensin disorder rather than a conventional viral pathogenesis disorder. Yeah, really interesting. Let, let's talk a bit about individual susceptibility because, you know, everybody worries that they may catch this disease. I mean, there's paranoia, uh, especially in London. You know, central London is as quiet as anything uh, yeah. because everybody's so paranoid they're going to get it. So why do some people seem mean, more or less immune uh, and others are susceptible, uh, age, uh, obesity, and so on? Let me... Oh, also say Stephen Chalicombe is one of our big supporters at uh, the RSM. He's saying, is it known whether that we mount a mucosal secretory AGA response to COVID or, or maybe that's protective? So let's talk a little bit about protection uh, of the individual against the disease because that's got to yeah. be immunological, hasn't it? It's, it's the central question, actually, because, you know, although the virus is interesting, it's really our response to the virus that I think distinguishes the wide variation in disease phenotypes that you see with the vast majority of people being really asymptomatic. And by that, I mean really, really asymptomatic all the way through to this really profound um, uh, pulmonary disease, but also coagulation abnormalities, vascular problems, cardiac problems. At the extreme severe end, it's really bad. So the, the, I think the central question is why do mostly young people not do too badly with this disease. And what we've now come to learn in the last three or four months is that there is quite a lot of T cell reactivity that is cross reactivity to conventional endemic coronaviruses that give us all a head cold in the winter. Those T cells that see the peptides from those coronaviruses also cross react with peptides in COVID-19. So that is, pretty interesting because some of these responses are pretty robust and it's hard to believe that that's not providing you with some ex to some extent with protection from the disease and, and and there are people who also are swab positive who don't mount antibody responses and it may well be that they have such good t-cell responses they never get a chance to mount an antibody response so understanding the t-cell response i think is really important and it 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 also plays into the individual liabilities because what we do know is that there's a phenomenon called t-cell senescence which occurs after the age of 65 or 70 where your t-cells sort of flake out when they're confronted with an antigenic challenge it's why elderly people have to have a different type of flu vaccine because they really don't respond to the ordinary flu vaccine very well so you've got to give them a bit more of a boost uh, and it's why you get you know another surge in many of these diseases in late life you get Obviously, you get shingles, you get RSV, the second peak is in late life. People with influenza uh, do much worse when they're old and they're young. So it's, it's very likely that the severity of the disease in the elderly may be related to the fact that your T cells have stopped to function. And so that background level of adaptive immunity that most of us have starts to fade away in the elderly, and they're very vulnerable then to the severe consequences of the disease. So I think that's I think that's very I think that's a very likely explanation. It also turns out that you know metabolic syndrome ain't great for your T cells. There's a there's a not a huge literature, but there is a bit of literature about how metabolic syndrome will actually affect your T cell function, and that might also account for some of the comorbidities that are important in the disease. What about the fact that I think it's seventy to thirty percent uh, men versus women um, getting the severe form of, of uh, COVID. Uh, is there any explanation? Is it the ACE receptor differences or? I, 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 so the answer is nobody's come up with a really good um, answer to that. There, 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 is, there is a story that 
um, men's T cells deteriorate um, at a different rate than female um, uh, T cell function in older life. But I've read the paper, paper ain't much good, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't bet the house on that. I think the answer is there's not much out there that explains the male female difference. Right. Um, there are a bit better data on metabolic syndrome, but, but, it, uh, but, not, but not much else. Um, so th those, are the, those are the major factors. But to get back to the point about mucosal immunity, what we do know is that innate immunity is probably pretty important in this disease. Mm -hmm. and, um, and that's evidence, you know, there's a nice little study about inhaled interferon beta, which looks like it's had an impressive effect at slowing the disease progression in people. That was work done by a Southampton spin out, um, uh, Steve Holgate's company, mm -hmm. which I can't remember the name of. But anyway, it, it, that data is small numbers, but it looks really impressive. So, and, and we know this virus is very good at avoiding interferon responses. So that aspect of innate immunity may prove to be quite important, important to bolster. Um, and then there are IgA responses to this virus, and people have thought about using that as a way of diagnosing the disease. It's evident in saliva as IgG and IgM uh, can also be found there, but IgA looks like it's the best thing to get out of saliva, as you might imagine. And um, uh, the, uh, there are also, as you know, innate cellular populations found in respiratory epithelium that also deteriorate with age and which may have an important role in this, totally unexplored at the moment. I think there needs to be a lot of work done in that space. But don't be surprised that these are all elements of our immune protection and response to the disease. Is there anything that we, that we could do for ourselves or for our patients to kind of G up our, uh, well, our T cell immunity or, or for that matter, our mucosal immunity? So, yeah, so th th there, there's a couple of observations that, and I, to be crystal clear, I'm not giving people advice to do anything about this, but you know, there is, there has been a story about whether BCG might be a helpful um, protective intervention. And of course, BCG is a kind of generic immune adjuvant. Um, and yeah, there is literature, actually relatively bad literature out there about that. But it, you know, there is a, a, there is a signal there, perhaps, that that might be in some way protected. People who've had BCG are protected against the disease. Um, the, the second thing is that, and, and this is work I th from the Gates Foundation, and, and if you look with all its issues at real world data, you know, trawling records, comparing them to outcomes in the clinic from COVID, one of the things that has popped up is that if you've had the Shingrix vaccine, and those of you who've had Shingrix vaccine, know that it's got a really potent adjuvant and it's a terrific vaccine i have to say it's really good but it's mostly driven by this great adjuvant that gsk has got um they look like they're pretty significantly protected from death from covid over the subsequent two years now that's you know that that is like all real world data it's it's you know potentially open to criticism and flaws i wouldn't but it, but it's interesting because that might well have, have produced a kind of general stimulation of T cells. I think it's also going to be crucial that whatever vaccine comes through, it's got to have an effect on T cells. Because if it's at all like the other SARS viruses, long-term immunity is going to re require T cells. And that, you know, these vaccines that produce good antibody responses, but no T cells, forget it, never going to work in my view. So uh, is President Putin's vaccine good for your T cells? <laughs> I, I don't I, I'm not sure President Putin knows what his vaccine is good for, to be honest, but <laughs> it, uh, it, was a, it was a great maneuver, actually. I'm not sure <laughs> I'm injecting my daughters with a, an untested vaccine, but anyway, there you are. It's fine. They should do what they do. It's all, yeah, that's up to them, not us. Do, do you think the fact that, that, that uh, he came out with that um, rather surprising uh, uh, message is, is, was, is actually uh, giving some uh, support to the anti-vax movement? Yeah, so I, I think one of our real challenges, and this would be a bigger challenge in the US than it is in the UK, you know, people are still skeptical about vaccines. And I think if there was any suggestion that the vaccines that we bring out for COVID, if we ever bring them out in the medium term, 
um, that, that if people have been cutting corners and the safety isn't quite what it should have been and the regulators have pushed it through for political reasons, I, I think you're gonna have a massive problem getting people to take it up. So I think we've got to play it straight down the line, do everything the way we would normally do it, make sure the safety gets done in the right way preclinically, make sure there's really careful safety monitoring in the, in the clinic, and, and that we're really robust about what we think is a real signal of efficacy. So I, I, I think I can't overestimate that a lot. And I think one of the problems with both the Chinese vaccine, which has gone into the army, I suspect on a non-voluntary basis, and the Russian vaccine um, is that it's going to make people are going to go. Uh, I'm not so sure about that. So there, there's a real issue of trust, I think, at the moment, and we've got to maintain that trust if we're going to make any vaccine program successful. John, you're you're the nearest thing that uh, the RSM's got uh, to a fortune teller. You're the sort of mystic Meg of COVID-19. Um, just project forward for say six, 12 months, you know, if we were having this conversation next year, sometime, maybe spring, autumn, what, 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 where will we be in terms of this disease? Second, second wave, third wave, uh, vaccine available, better testing. Just give us a, a yeah. Kind of, a so fun, it's a, a good fun. question. Actually, nobody's actually asked, asked me that question, but it's something I think about quite a lot. So, um, my my bet is that we will get a second wave and the vaccines won't get here in time to stop the second wave. And I'm not sure the new home testing is going to get there in time either, but it'll take, it perhaps will take the edge off it. Um, and, uh, but then I suspect by Christmas or early in the new year, there may be more than one option for vaccines. I, my suspicion is the vaccines will work a bit. They won't sterilize people, but they'll take the edge off the disease and they'll definitely be worth using in a population, but they won't, they're, they're not gonna solve this problem. And by the way, the rest of the world is still gonna have COVID going through the winter. It's gonna be a really bumpy winter, particularly if we get a bit of flu in the background because the hospitals are gonna be beside themselves. And that's why the testing regime is gonna have to carry on and continue because we're gonna try and be separating flu from COVID and making diagnosis at home and keeping people at home or a swab positive and the likes. In the meanwhile, I'm pretty optimistic we'll get at least one or maybe two new therapies. So we've already got dexamethasone. We're, I think we're definitely gonna get a neutralizing monoclonal antibody and they could be very, very good for sick people. So that, uh, that and also for prophylaxis in healthcare workers. Just, just elaborate a little bit more on that. So how would they work, the neutralizing antibody? So, so we know that neutralizing antibodies are, are probably protective to the disease. And we know that convalescent people after the disease start with relatively high levels of neutralizing antibodies. And it's one of the markers we're guiding, our, guiding us on vaccines. So it's possible to make those neutralizing antibodies by taking B cells out of people who've been infected, finding the antibodies that are neutralizing that bind to the receptor binding domain of spike and then growing those up, uh, fusing them as a hybridoma, and then growing them up as a monoclonal antibody. And, and then you, you, it would be a therapeutic like any other monoclonal antibody that would, you could give by either infusion or injection. Um, there are about four or five of those out there now. Lily has probably got the leading one. They're using the upseller antibody. They're well into third, phase three. I'm expecting to see a signal from Lily um, sometime in the next six weeks. Uh, Regeneron has got a, 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 a cocktail of two antibodies. AstraZeneca has got a cocktail of two antibodies. There's a good Chinese biotech antibody that looks the same. And then there's a variety of others in the next wave. So there's a, a good camel antibody that's very, very potent. There's a number of other human antibodies. So, it, you know, these would be really, and, and in the, in the, in the, um, non-human primate studies, they've been very effective at halting the disease and, and not completely, but largely clearing the virus. So that would be a terrific, that would be a terrific adjunct to what we had in the clinic and will be uh, another line of defense. So I think we'll have, you know, two or three pretty good therapies. We'll have a couple of vaccines that won't be perfect, but will work pretty well. And we'll have pretty systematic testing, which is gonna be ongoing, I'm afraid. 
for quite a while to try and manage the disease. And, and we'll have growing levels of immunity in the population. So they, you know, the real question which is out there now is, what does it take to get herd, herd immunity? People calculating herd immunity, I don't think assumed that we would have this level of T cell immunity in the population. And that may make it easier to get to herd immunity if lots of us have got T cell immunity that largely protects us from the disease. So, so we may be closer to herd immunity than we originally thought. And it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. So I'm, I'm, a, I, I'm not an optimist. I'm not, I, I don't have a, I don't have a magic wand and we'll say by the end of September, we'll all be fine. But I, I think by next spring, things are going to be looking a lot better. And yet, do you think the virus might just go away as uh, President Trump uh, told us it would? And, and after all, influenza did and SARS did. Um, could COVID just go away? Yeah, so, so I suspect it'll probably come in epidemic waves, a bit like influenza. So it will go away, but it'll still be out there. And there'll still be quite a bit in the population. I mean, look at New Zealand. New Zealand was disease free for months and then bingo, off they go again. So mm -hmm. I, I think there's gonna, be, there's gonna be a long tail to this. And I think we'll end up probably as a pop, global population having seasonal coronavirus vaccines to actually try and manage the risk. That's, that I suspect is where this is all gonna end up. Yeah, and maybe, yeah, maybe a combination of coronavirus and influenza, I suppose. Uh, yeah, well that, I mean, when you're in for your influenza, you probably have both actually. Yeah. We're running out of time, but, you, but you're so informative. Uh, it seems a shame to, to lose the opportunity to ask you one last question. You know, everybody's paranoid about getting the flu and getting COVID together. Uh, so is the message to get vaccinated, whatever your age is, is that, would that be a good message? Yeah, so I, I'm, I'm a real advocate of widespread flu vaccines. I, I know there are people saying the best way to spread COVID is everybody getting a cue for a flu vaccine. I think that's a bit of a, that, that's a, that people will criticize everything. That's, I think, a pretty dumb argument. I, I think we can get ourselves vaccinated for flu without all catching COVID. And at least we'll know whether somebody who comes into the A&E department with a, a bad pulmonary problem, whether they've been vaccinated for flu. And as a result, the likelihood is it's a COVID uh, pathogenesis. I, I think the testing will also be really helpful because with fast turnaround testing for both flu and COVID, we should be able to dissect the two pretty quickly. And there's a big effort to try and make sure that the two of those things goes, goes together. So, so but it, just to be crystal clear, it, it's gonna be a bumpy winter. There's nothing I can see that's gonna make this an easy winter. Like the Game of Thrones, winter is coming. Uh, yeah, absolutely. J John, thank you so much. I mean, you've given us so much amazing information. Uh, uh, and I think you've given us some hope as well uh, that maybe uh, it's not going to be quite as bad as, as people think. So thank you so much. We'll leave you now to enjoy right. the, the Dreaming Spires of Oxford. And uh, just a, a couple of announcements to say that um, next week we have another high profile expert speaking to uh, uh, David Spiegelha Spiegelhalter, get the name right, Spiegelhalter, who's from, um, not from Oxford, but from Cambridge uh, University. And he'll be talking about statistics uh, related to COVID. Again, controversial topic with uh, Sir Simon Wesley. Um, thank you all for listening, tuning in. Remember that the Royal Society of Medicine is on the back foot financially. So if you feel like making a contribution to our ongoing uh, education effort, please, uh, please do that. We'd be most grateful, most appreciative. And hopefully we'll see you next week. Uh, for the next of our COVID-19 series. Have a great afternoon, everybody. Goodbye.